everybody. Uh, it is a little bit after five. Um, thanks for being here tonight. I know we're a small group and I know we're also a tired group. <laughs> we just have VBS. Um, and so we may be out of here. We, we may keep this a little brief tonight. Um, and, unless you object, I have material we could try to go longer, but uh, we may we may be uh, having a, a briefer uh, Bible study tonight. But thanks for being here. Uh, we'll begin, of course, by going to God in prayer. Uh, I know the Fry's are still out. We want to pray for their safe travels. Uh, do we have any other prayer requests we'd like to, to lift up to God uh, this evening? Daisy? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Charles, any update on Guy Rosenbaum, his, his dad with the stroke? Yeah, Sue's so still waiting on the pet, can, uh, pet scan results, and uh, we want to be praying for her. All right, well, um, let's bow and go to God in prayer. Thank you, Father, for this uh, hour of Bible study, uh, this hour of singing praise to you and discussing some things from your word. We pray that this is an edifying time and that you are glorified uh, in this hour. We pray for that matter that you're glorified in all of our lives. And we pray that you bless us as we move forward into this week, that you'll give us strength, uh, courage, that you will bless us with peace and patience and uh, help us to be um, truly walking in the steps of your son. And we pray you'll be gracious to us when we fail and that you will continue to strengthen us and conform us to his image. Father, we lift up those we've mentioned just now, uh, we want to continue to pray for uh, Dale and Doris, uh, such uh, wonderful followers of you, such a such a great they're such a great source of encouragement to so many here, and we've missed seeing them uh, lately with Doris's declining health and Dale uh, having some health issues himself while taking care of her. Please bless them both. Uh, we pray that they know each day that they're loved by this church family and that they're loved by you most of all. Uh, we pray your blessings on both of them. We also lift up our sister Sue, uh, who's awaiting uh, PET scan results. And um, this is a time of, of uncertainty for them and anxiety. And we pray that you'll surround them at this time and that uh, you'll bless them moving forward based on what those results reveal and that you'll, you'll bless doctors and nurses. And we pray that Sue will be, uh, be in good health, be restored to health. Uh, we're so thankful for, for the ways that they contribute to this church family as well. Father, we want to lift up our sister Carolyn Justice and the passing of her mother uh, with the funeral coming up this Wednesday. We want to ask your blessings on her and her family. Uh, Lord, we also uh, want to lift up Guy Rosenbaum's father who had a stroke and is still not doing well. Uh, just doesn't have motion on his right side or doesn't have use of it. Please bless him, his family. Uh, we pray your blessings on his health and also his emotional and spiritual health. Lord, again, bless this time tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, uh, we'll sing a few songs together related to God's Word. We, we spent some time this morning thinking about spending time in God's Word as part of practicing our faith as something that will also train us and grow us towards holiness. So we'll sing some songs uh, along those lines. Um, okay, my apologies, the projector is not turned on. Um, give me just a second. <clears throat> While it's coming up, I think our first song is in the hymnal anyway. So maybe we could just use that. <clears throat> Let's see if I can find the number.
Uh, 895, if you'd like to turn there, so we don't have to wait on the projector too terribly long. 895. <clears throat> Thy word. We'll sing it through. Uh, well, there's two verses, and we'll sing them both. <clears throat> Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. When I feel afraid, I think I've lost my way. Still you're there right beside me. Nothing will I fear as long as you are near. Please be near me to the end. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I will not forget your love for me, and yet I'll forever be wandering. Jesus, be my guide, hold me to your side. I will love you to the end. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. <coughs> Excuse me, my throat is awfully itchy right now. <coughs> All right, let's see if this is working now. It's still not. Hmm. All right, let's try this again. <clears throat> Our next song is only on the screen, so we need it now. Actually, that's not true. It's our third song that's only on the screen, so we can use the hymnals again. Give me just a second here. Okay, here we go. song is Wonderful Words of Life. <clears throat> Sing them over again to me, wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see, wonderful words of life. Words of life and beauty, teach me faith and duty. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Christ the Blessed One gives to all wonderful words of life. Sinnerless to the loving call, wonderful words of life. Also freely given, wooing us to heaven. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Sweetly echo the gospel call, wonderful words of life. Offer pardon and peace to all, wonderful words of life. Jesus, only Savior, sanctify forever. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. 
Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. <clears throat> Next song will be Ancient Words. Holy words, long preserved for our walk in this world. They resound with God's own heart. Oh, let the ancient words impart words of life, words of hope. Give us strength, help us cope in this world where'er we roam. Ancient words will guide us home. Ancient words ever true, changing me and changing you. We have come with open hearts. Oh, let the ancient words impart. Holy words of our faith, handed down to this age, came to us through sacrifice. Oh, heed the faithful words of Christ. Holy words, long preserved for our walk in this world. They resound with God's own heart. Oh, let the ancient words impart. Ancient words ever true, changing me and changing you. We have come with open hearts. Oh, let the ancient words impart. Ancient words ever true, changing me and changing you. We have come with open hearts. Oh, let the ancient words impart. We have come with open hearts. Oh, let the ancient words impart. So again, we spend our time uh, today, I realized I didn't bring my own Bible, what a shame, I've, I've got it on my laptop. Um, we spend our time today, uh, during the sermon portion of worship, talking about sp spending time practicing our faith by practicing it in God's Word, uh, and how this is a vital spiritual practice that goes hand in hand with prayer. These are both fundamental parts of, of things that Christians do, and things Christians do that train them to live out their faith even more faithfully. Um, again, we may not be here for too terribly long, uh, but one parable I wanted to take some time to focus on that I didn't touch on this morning is found in Matthew chapter 13. It's called sometimes the parable of the scribe, and it's one of the more obscure parables of Jesus. It's very short. I don't know how well known it is. I haven't heard it preached or taught very often, but I think it does relate to... Um, a great truth about spending time in God's Word. So I encourage you to, to turn there in your own Bible or perhaps use the Pew Bible if you don't have yours, but it's Matthew 13, uh, verses 51 and 52. <clears throat> Matthew 13, 51 and 52. It begins with Jesus asking a question. He says, Have you understood all these things? They said to him, Yes. And he said to them, Therefore every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. I want to take just a minute to set some context here. Right before Jesus asked this question, Have you understood all these things? He, te he tells a series of parables. Uh, you've got the parable of, uh, and, and my translation very help helpfully provides headings for each one, parable of the net, parable of the pearl of great price, a uh, parable of the kingdom of heaven being like a treasure hidden in a field, 
uh, parable of the weeds, which Jesus takes time to explain. We got the mustard seed and the leaven, um, parable of the sower. So all these teachings of Jesus, and if we remember about Jesus' parables, they had the, uh, the tendency to confuse some people, actually confuse a good number of people, and even some of those who maybe should have, maybe were best placed to understand it. Jesus sometimes had to explain the parables to them. And so he asks here, have you understood all these things? And actually, um, the disciples reply, in this case, yes, they, they do believe they're understanding what Jesus is saying. And then, then he states in verse 52 this brief, really one-sentence parable. But he talks about here how every scribe, he says a scribe is like this. He says specifically a scribe is like a master of a house. So to understand this parable, I think we first need to understand a little bit about the scribe. Who were the scribes in Jesus' time? Copying Writing out, yeah, God's word, copying manuscripts. That would be, I mean, when we think of a scribe, that's a fundamental function of theirs. And scribes are often in the Gospels paired with the Pharisees, and they're presented as being among the religious elite, being among the religious leaders, the religious experts, and they're trained very closely in knowledge of Scripture. And that makes sense, because if they are copying this stuff, that would give them a lot of familiarity with it, uh, and, and they would naturally be trained not only in, in knowing the, the words on the, on, the, on the scroll, but being trained in understanding what it means. Uh, they probably would have been involved in teaching other Jews, maybe even when they're children, and how to how to recite scripture, uh, perhaps how, how to read scripture. So these are the scribes in Jesus' time. Were the scribes typically on good terms with Jesus? They were often not. Again, they're often paired with other members of the religious elite, like the Pharisees, and the Pharisees are often uh, at odds with Jesus in the Gospels. But Jesus here describes not just any scribe, he describes a, a certain kind of scribe, is specifically a scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is what Jesus proclaims all throughout his ministry. And he's saying a scribe who's trained for that kingdom. And so this is different from the scribes who oppose Jesus. The scribes who oppose Jesus probably think they're being trained for the kingdom of heaven. But then when the king of that kingdom comes among them, they oppose him. Right? So they think they're being trained one way, but they're actually being trained in opposition to the kingdom of heaven, you could say. But Jesus says here that this kind of scribe, a scribe who's trained for the kingdom of heaven, he says he's like a master of a house. That's a little easier for us to picture. Think about maybe a wealthy landowner or someone like that. A master bringing treasure out of his house. But it's not just generic treasure. He's not just bringing, you know, all the treasure and it just, it's all lumped in one big pile. Um, he says he's bringing out new treasure and old treasure, bring out new and old treasure. How is it you think a scribe can be like this kind of master? How do these, clearly these two things relate. How do you think they connect to one another? How is a scribe like a master bringing out new and old treasure from a house? Any thoughts? Daisy. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, scribes have great authority. Masters of a house have great authority. Yeah, absolutely. Thinking also about the new and old treasures. And these scribes are trained in scripture, right? There are new and old insights, I won't say new and old truths because they're timeless truths, but there, there are new and old insights in God's word, aren't there? And a scribe uh, trained for the kingdom of heaven, Jesus says, brings out both. And th this is actually very clearly true on the pages of the rest of the New Testament. What we call the Old Testament, for them it was just the scriptures, but what we call the Old Testament it was already old by the time of the New Testament. It had been around for a long time. But Jesus' death and resurrection helped.
helped the, the early Christians. We see this especially in like Paul and Hebrews, but other Revelation, other places. The death and resurrection of Jesus helped them see those old scriptures in new ways. So there was truly old treasure and new treasure. There was what the text had, had meant and had been interpreted to mean for hundreds and hundreds of years. And there's also this new light thrown on those texts by Jesus and, and by what, G, what God has accomplished uh, in Jesus. And in the same way, I think anyone who's spent time in, in Scripture knows there's old treasures in the Scriptures. There are things that maybe we've heard, taught, and preached many times, things that we have observed many times as we've read uh, the Scriptures. But then sometimes, suddenly, we may make a connection uh, in a Bible class setting or in our own. We may make a connection to some other passage we've never made before or some key truth of Scripture connects to this passage, and we've never made that connection before. But now that we see it, we see well, we're not just making this up. This isn't just, you know, me making the Scripture mean whatever I want to mean. Like, this connection is clearly there. I just, I just hadn't seen it before. Uh, and, and sometimes it's our life circumstances that bring this out. You know, we may be in a setting in life where we're experiencing things that we hadn't experienced before, and now Scripture takes on a whole new dimension for us because of our own life circumstances. So again, for us as well, there are new and old treasures to be found in God's Word. Um, and so this connects a little bit with one point I, I did make this morning that Psalm 119 uh, draws out in, in one passage where, where the psalmist there says, Open my eyes to behold wondrous things from your law. There really is always something new to be gleaned, always, always some new way that the Scriptures can, can deepen our understanding and grow us in wisdom. But I, I do want to mention with this parable, notice that Jesus makes it clear we need both the old and new treasure. He doesn't say that one of these is better than the other. He doesn't say you should only grab from the old pile or the new pile. He indicates that both of these are it's both treasure, right? And the, the scribe, the master of the house, brings them both out. And I think that does touch on an important truth that we need the old and new treasure and that they help balance one another. And it's, it's valuable to think about what would happen if we only have one or the other, if we only chose one, of, one over the other. And sometimes Christians do this. So sometimes Christians can only want the old treasures uh, and, and think that there's really nothing else to be said about what the Scriptures teach that hasn't, already be said, that hasn't already been said. All the truth there is has been uncovered, and all we got to do is just keep saying it over and over and over again. Uh, and if we're just focusing on the old treasure that can kind of lull us to sleep spiritually, right? Um, if we're only focusing on the things that we know uh, to be true, that have been true for, for generations, that can just kind of, you know, we can get so used to it. And that can also lead us, if, if we're only holding on to old teachings and ideas, uh, it could lead us to actually perpetuate false teachings and ideas. You know, there are false teachings that are old. And if we're not looking at those teachings with judgment and discerning them by scripture, we might be upholding false teachings that are old just because they're old. Uh, so, so that can be a danger of just having the old treasure. But then think about if you only have the new treasure. If someone is only looking for new treasure in God's word, that might make them really kind of skeptical and really dismissive of uh, maybe any idea or teaching that isn't like cutting edge and isn't really, you know, contemporary or, or, the, or any teaching that comes from an older generation, they may want to just dismiss it because they think, well, that, that's probably, they wouldn't actually say this, but they say, well, that's kind of like the old treasure and I just want the new treasure. Uh, and, and if we only want that, that can, first of all, make us really arrogant. You know, it's pretty arrogant to just dismiss the wisdom of our elders and dismiss the wisdom of previous generations of Christians. And it can also lead us to throw away good teachings, right? Throw away biblically sound teachings that have been preached and taught for generations, and as we do that, we might interject a lot of new false teachings and false ideas, um, and so truly we need to be seeking both. We need both in balance with one another. There are old and new treasures in God's Word, and we don't need to dismiss either. We need to be looking for both, and that will help us, I think, remain balanced and secure and truly rooted in um, God's Word. I know this is kind of a strange parable, uh, and again, not one that I've heard many sermons or, or Bible classes on. and um, So, any, any thoughts or reflections on, on this little parable that we just looked at?
Yeah, Tanisha. Oh, yeah. Think about just Jew and Gentile division? Yes. Yeah. 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 I appreciate you saying that it takes, we need that wisdom and discernment to handle the old and the new treasures wisely, uh, because without it, I mean, we can really mismanage these treasures, you know, and really make the scriptures say things that they don't say, and really apply them in ways that they were never meant to be applied. So yeah, it really does take discernment. Any other thoughts on this parable? Yeah, Jason. Absolutely. And I'll, I'll put in a plug here for our class on Acts on Sunday mornings. I think we'll see a lot of that in the book of Acts because as, as the gospel is proclaimed, especially when it's being proclaimed to Jews in synagogues and stuff, a lot of scripture is quoted and it's going to be applied to Christ. Uh, and we're going to see a lot of that new light being thrown on these scriptures because of him. Yeah. Well, um, one other comment that uh, can maybe just be a word of application to us from this, and then you may take a couple moments to try to apply this a little bit to a specific portion of Scripture. We 
talked about how the scribes were people of great authority because they'd been trained. And maybe there's a little bit of a double meaning, or maybe if it's not a double meaning, it certainly applies to both, both instances of both things I'm about to say. A scribe is someone who's been trained. The kingdom of heaven has people who are trained very specifically for the same purpose that scribes w would have been trained in, in Jesus' time. And this is on the page of the New Testament. I mean, Paul clearly, you know, as an apostle, uh, he'd received, he talks about how his training before knowing Christ really equipped him, you know, sitting at the feet of Gamaliel and, and these kinds of things. There are qualifications given for elders, and they're supposed to be able to really handle the word of God well. There's also kind of a generic class of teachers that are mentioned in the New Testament. Clearly, they're supposed to be, if they're going to be teaching, they need to be qualified in some way. So there's like a specialized sense of scribes who are trained for the kingdom of heaven, and they have the responsibility. Uh, and this is a responsibility that I seek to take very seriously, of, of bringing out those old and new treasures for all the people of God. Uh, and so in one sense, maybe we could think about those specialized scribes, but also think about more generic, more, more broadly, uh, all of us have the capability to be the scribes who were trained for the kingdom of heaven. And e even think about those, those early scribes among, the, among the, the early church. You do have some people like Paul who clearly had received a lot of training. Then you've got like Peter who's a fisherman, right? And that doesn't mean that he hadn't received some, some good instruction in the law, but it's a, it's a far step from like a scribe or, or someone who's sat at the feet of Gamaliel as a Pharisee. It, it, they're not on the same plane. Um, and so there, there's really a sense in which all of us are called to be these scribes who were trained for the kingdom of heaven. Um, so we can all be seeking to bring out those new and old treasures, both to one another and just in our own lives. Bring out, bring out those new and old treasures for, for us to enjoy ourselves as we're individually looking into God's word. Uh, maybe we'll just take a couple minutes here to apply this a little bit to a psalm. I spent a lot of time this morning reading from Psalm 119, uh, but there's a, another psalm that is kind of like a little snapshot that has so many of the truths of Psalm 119 captured in just a few verses. That's actually Psalm 1. So maybe turn in your Bibles to Psalm 1, and we'll just see what types of new or old treasure we find here. Psalm 1, uh, this is, again, only six verses. I'll just read it first, and it's broken into three uh, neat parts, verses 1 and 2, 3 and 4, and 5 and 6. So we'll just take a minute to look at each part, um, but let me just read the whole thing first. Psalm 1, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. So there's Psalm 1, which is another psalm, a bit like Psalm 119, kind of celebrating God's word. Now, in a way, it's especially celebrating the person who follows God's word, but that you can't really do that without, without also celebrating God's word. Um, so let's just look back over this for a moment. Look with me at verses 1 and 2. What, what things do you see there that maybe would be worth mentioning to the group as good applications or good truths that are right there in verses 1 and 2? Something that I noticed, notice we have this um, contrast with a, a sinner, someone, you know, walking, so, someone living in a way contrary to God, and notice we have walking, standing, and sitting for him. Walking in the counsel of the wicked, standing in the way of sinners, sitting in the seat of scoffers. So, I mean, that's pretty much all the motions that we can do physically, right? We're, all, we're either on the go, or we're standing still, or we're sitting down. Uh, of course, I guess the sleep we're laying down, but, but the, the point is still there. Um, and then we have, in contrast with this, a person who is day and night meditating on the law. There's also something holistic there. You can't really divide up, you know, that captures the whole day. It's either day or night, right? So we, in both cases, 
Psalm 1 is talking about a whole life preoccupation, someone whose entire way of life is caught up in one of two ways. Uh, they're either, their whole life is either spent living contrary to God or their whole life is spent delighting in the law of the Lord. Um, so, so we see this kind of whole life focus. And, and he's saying that blessed is the man whose whole life focus is on the law of the Lord. His whole life is set on meditating on, uh, on his will, on his law, on his scriptures. How about verses 3 and 4? Well, here, one thing that I thought maybe was worth mentioning was we have another contrast. We had this whole life preoccupation contrasted with the wicked and the righteous, verses 1 and 2. Here we have this contrast of the sturdiness of a tree and the lightness of chaff. And that's a super strong contrast, right? I mean, trees aren't going anywhere. And chaff, you go anywhere the wind takes it, right? Super strong uh, contrast. And then also we have this contrast of the fruitfulness of a tree. This is a tree that's planted by streams of water. Uh, its leaves are not dying. It yields fruit in its season. So there's value here to this tree. There's life, uh, and that life is blessing others with the, light, with the fruit that it can produce. And then what's the deal with chaff? It's kind of worthless, right? You want to separate the wheat from the chaff, right? Um, so there's a, an, an emptiness there, a worthlessness there, where you, you want it out because you want just the wheat. Um, yeah, Luann, go ahead. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and that's a great, that's a very important contrast because sometimes we can fall into the, the mindset of kind of doing this all on our own, uh, but this is a tree, the only reason this tree is doing what it's doing so well is because it's constantly receiving nourishment from an outside source, right? It's, it's not going it alone on its own strength, it's receiving constant nourishment. Uh, Tanisha? Yeah, absolutely. Provide some, some anchoring for us. Well, uh, let's move on to the last part. How about verses 5 and 6? One thing that I was thinking about is when it says the Lord knows the way of the righteous. I wonder, I wonder, why do you think he says that? The Lord knows everything. So you'd think he would know not only the way of the righteous, but also the way of the wicked. But instead we have this contrast. The Lord knows the way of the righteous. The way of the wicked will perish. Daisy. Oh, yeah. What translation are you reading from? Okay. And what, what else? Does anybody have something different there in their translation besides no or watches over? This is, that, this is a great exercise in seeing that it can be difficult to move from one language to another. But it also draws out that knowing is not always the same. There's levels of knowing. There's different kinds of knowing. Of course the Lord knows the ways of the wicked in that He's omniscient, right? He, he knows what they're doing, but he knows the ways of the righteous. 
in the sense of he watches over them, right? He's, he's knowing in that that is a, a type of knowing that leads to care and protection is so a knowing that leads to action. Um, Tanisha, go ahead. Yeah, there's a knowing, especially when we move into relationships, there's a whole different levels of knowing there, right? There's tons of celebrities we know in the sense we know of them. We know their names because they fill the headlines, but we don't know them like we know family members. Uh, and the Lord knows the way of the righteous in that level. And thinking about maybe some new and old treasure, think about this in light of Christ. He knows the ways of the righteous because he's walked it as a human being. Right? That's something that couldn't have been said before Jesus came. But Jesus, the Lord knows the ways of the, of the righteous, uh, and he knows how hard it is, uh, but he also knows that it can be walked. And Hebrews especially draws this out. Because of that, he's able to help us. Uh, he, he's able to, to work with us, walk with us, be patient with us, because he knows what it's like to walk that path. So Psalms, Psalm 1 is another great celebration of God's word, um, a bit like Psalm 119. Um, and I think it's a good, maybe a good place to see where so there can be some new and old treasure brought out for us. Um, any other thoughts or reflections on anything we've talked about tonight before we wrap up? Oh, yeah. Therefore, the ungodly will not stand in judgment. That's right. So here we have they won't stand in judgment. New Testament talks about everybody's going to be judged. Any thoughts on that? I think this might go back to what it means to stand in judgment. Um, and, of course, we're reading poetry here, but... Think of someone who can stand through judgment, before the judgment, during the judgment, and after the judgment. They've made it through the judgment process. They've been approved. They can stand, not proudly in the arrogant sense, but they can stand unashamed, right, in judgment, because they're approved by the Lord. But the wicked is someone, they can't do that. Uh, the judgment is, is going to condemn them, and so they won't be standing at the end of it. I think that that's probably the imagery that the psalm is trying to, to draw out. So we will all stand before God, but who's going to pass through that judgment approved by him It will not be the wicked. That's what I think is going on. Does that make sense? Kind of. Any other thoughts? That I, you think I'm on the right track, or maybe is there another way to make sense of what's going on here? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Or sometimes, um, like in, in readings for classes and things, someone will talk about how an argument is unsustainable, right? It, it won't stand scrutiny. Uh, and I, I think that's, that's the idea here is the wicked will not bear up under that judgment. Does that coincide with uh, Isaiah 59? What, is, what does that say? that up real quick. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, or his ear dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Mm. Does seem to be there's some overlap. I, I have always pictured someone talking about a final judgment, 
certainly reading it in light of what the New Testament says about final judgment. It's easy to, to see someone reflecting that. Isaiah 59 seems to talk about prior to judgment during our lifetime. Um, but there's a truth underlying both of them, right? Wicked won't stand in judgment. And the Lord won't hear the wicked's prayers. And this maybe goes back a little bit to that kind of knowing and hearing. You know, God knows everything. He knows what the wicked pray, but he doesn't hear the prayers in the sense of listen to them and respond to them. Uh, he, doesn't, he doesn't entertain them, perhaps thinking like, maybe like, um, I don't know, if you're some authority figure and you're receiving, e you're receiving emails, you know, and some of them are from terrible employees and they're asking all these things, well, you may not be inclined to, to acquiesce to their requests, right? You're not going to hear their, their requests in that sense. Uh, but maybe those who are, you know, really faithful and diligent and they've got good ideas and they're invested, you want to hear what they have to say. Um, does that make sense? Maybe. What are you thinking? I agree. God, I, I, would, I would say that God doesn't hear it in the sense of hear it and respond to it. it. Being omniscient, I think he knows what they're saying, but he's not going to receive that prayer the way he would receive the prayer of someone who is in Christ and seeking to follow him, or maybe someone who doesn't yet know God through Christ, but is seeking and searching. Uh, but that is different from perhaps the prayer of the wicked, someone who's just close their heart off to God, and maybe they're deluded and they don't even realize they've done that, but they've kind of slowly deceived themselves and, and think they're all right. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, Sanisha. Thank you. 
This is a great example of the communal nature of spending time in God's Word. Uh, it's not meant to just be an individualistic exercise. It's when we're having these conversations that we can come into more and more understanding. Um, I know the thief on the cross is uh, a powerful, we were in Luke talking about it, it's such a powerful moment. 
And it can sometimes be mis misunderstood in light of what the rest of Scripture says connected to the new covenant and, and the relationship between repentance and baptism, etc. But I want to go back to what you initially said, Ernie, about God not hearing certain prayers and God may God, God would hear the prayer of someone who's lived in rebellion, lived wickedly, but then perhaps near the end of their life, they say, Lord, I, I, I want to know your will. Can you send someone? Can you help me understand? You know, God will hear that prayer as opposed to someone who just continues in wickedness and they're praying to God. God will not hear the prayer. Thief on the cross is a good example of that because you have two thieves saying two different things. Jesus hears them both physically, but he only responds to one, right? He responds to the one who is uh, turning from his wickedness in repentance. Is that, is that, I think, what you were getting at? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that is, I, I think that's such a great object lesson, though, for what we were talking about, about the Lord knowing the way of the righteous, but also knowing everything. The Lord hearing all prayers, but only hearing the prayers of the righteous. Jesus physically heard them both, but at a deeper level, he only really heard one, right? Um, and so maybe that's a good object lesson for the very thing Psalm 1 and Isaiah 59 is talking about. Any other thoughts or reflections? We, I know I said we'd be done short, but um, we ended up having some good conversation, and we're, we're done a little bit after, actually. Is there anyone here who needs to take the Lord's Supper? Yeah, okay. Uh, do you already have a communion cup there, Jason? All right. If there's nothing else, then let's, uh, then let's go to God in prayer for the bread. Father God, at this moment, we want to before you and give thanks for the body of your son that was given for us. Father, we pray that you will continually hear our prayers, our desire to seek you, to embrace your son, to live faithfully in his steps. We are so grateful for that sacrifice made for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, at this time, we also pray your blessings over this cup. Uh, we're so thankful for the blood shed for us, for the forgiveness of our sins. Uh, we pray that in the way Christ poured himself out for us, that we will daily uh, pour ourselves out for you in love and service, um, that we will know your love for us more day by day. In Jesus' name, amen. Say one more prayer and we'll be dismissed. Father God, thank you for this time. Thank you for this time of discussion, this time of reading in your word. Father, we want to pray you bless each one of us, whether we're assembled together for worship or Bible class or some other occasion or whether we're in the privacy of our own homes. Uh, we pray that you will train us uh, to be like, uh, like a scribe. We pray that we will all be scribes trained for the kingdom of heaven and that you will bless us to truly bring forth those new and old treasures uh, so that we can see the depths of your word, apply it faithfully, teach it to others, reflect it to the world. Uh, we pray that this will be a, a regular feature of our faith. It's such, such a fundamental part of practicing our faith, and we pray that it will truly sustain us and give us life, just like that tree in Psalm 1 planted by the rivers of water. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thank you, everybody.